True Crime is far and away the most popular podcast genre. True Crime series and documentaries are among the most watched on video streaming services. Why? I'm Larry Fedorik, and this is Later That Same Life. On this weekly podcast, topics, discussions, stories from our lives. Season 10, Chapter 3, True Crime. After I wrapped my first podcast series, I Was 8, there was no shortage of suggestions as to what I should tackle in a new podcast series. A lot of people said, you should do true crime, do a true crime series. Everybody loves true crime. The fact that I had very little interest in the genre and no area of expertise seemed irrelevant to my voluntary consultants. Larry, you got to do true crime. I actually thought about it for a while. Thought I could cover crimes from around my own neighborhood. Yeah, that's a good idea. You know, the story of the stay-at-home dad, quiet guy, mostly kept to himself, but then suddenly, one day, without warning, was witnessed not coming to a full stop at the stop sign near his house. In broad daylight. How about that organized gang of ruthless dog walkers? Yeah, they let their pets run free even though it's not a leash-free park. My neighborhood is rife with true crime. The jaywalker, the litterer, the guy who smokes less than 30 feet from the entrance. True crimes. I could cover them all, tell the stories, showcase the hapless victims living with these threats day in and day out. And as riveting as that sounds, I decided against it. You know, to tell the real crime stories would involve a lot of research. A lot. You know what they say, don't do the true crime if you can't do the true time. The reason I'm doing this podcast episode about why true crime is so popular is that my own interest in these stories has been piqued lately. I never thought that I was that into true crime stories. Even now, I don't seek them out or binge on any crime series. But if one comes up, say, like on my Facebook feed, I end up watching the whole thing and take great interest in it. Sometimes I'll remember the story from the news, sometimes not. But I was amazed at how easily intrigued I became by the narrative. I could suddenly understand how it was so easy to get hooked on the genre. How come? So I did a little research on this, and the answers are fascinating, some quite evident, some not as. A lot of experts trace the beginning of the genre to 1965 and a four-part series in the New Yorker magazine written by Truman Capote. The series proved so popular that within a year it was released in book form. The book was In Cold Blood. Capote recounts the story of the murders of a farming family near a small Kansas community in 1959. Capote's book became an instant bestseller, spawned a hit Hollywood movie of the same name by 1967, and today the book remains the second best-selling true crime book in publishing history, outsold only by 1974's Helter Skelter. The story of the Charles Manson family, the murders, and the trial. Helter Skelter and Cold Blood are the grandparents of every true crime series and podcast there is today. Both In Cold Blood and Helter Skelter go against one of the main reasons we love crime stories. And that is, we love playing detective. We love a good detective story a felony mystery, solving the crime through our own brilliant deductions well ahead of the last chapter. And that's the first reason I'll mention as to why the crime sagas are popular. We love playing detective, but the granddaddies in cold blood and helter skelter were neither whodunits nor will they get caught. We already knew all that, yet we were drawn to the details and the promise of all the gory details by the end of the last page. That is what pulled us in. 
The landmark and iconic TV series Columbo also played on that principle. You may remember the opening scene of a Columbo murder mystery show. It portrayed the killer committing the murder. We knew who did it and how they did it. And after the first commercial break, it was obvious that LAPD Lieutenant Columbo also knew who it was. The fun of the next 90 minutes, how this disheveled everyman would outsmart the conniving killer. It was brilliant and highly successful. So even if we already know a lot of the plot points, we do still love to play detective in our minds, right along with the story. If I listen to a crime podcast that I remember from the news, I already know how it all turned out. But I want the gory details. Of course, this could all be considered recent history, or even just civilization repeating our historical habits. On the podcast Wisecrack, which also looked at the popularity of true crime, they contend that this all began in the Middle Ages with the advent of the printing press. Interesting theory. During those times when a convicted criminal was locked in the stocks or possibly even hung in the town square, posters were displayed detailing the dastardly deeds of the despicable demon about to die. Townsfolk not only gathered en masse to read the details, but to watch the execution, which was to serve not only as a deterrent to crime, but a comfort to the villagers that laws and rules were being enforced. Eventually, these true crime story posters were turned into crime pamphlets, and they were distributed far and wide, and they were even used by church clergy to stress the importance of staying on the straight and narrow. To this day, crime is still used as a political tool to seek increased support for our policing and justice systems. So I guess I'll go along with that notion that the fascination with true crime is not necessarily a recent phenomena, but one that's been around hundreds and hundreds of years. This leads me to my next two theories as to why true crime is currently so well received. First is availability. From a poster near the gallows to pamphlets throughout the countryside to books, newspapers, and electronic media, the more these crime stories were available, the more popular they became. I call it my Coca-Cola theory. How did Coca-Cola become number one? Well, sure, it's a fine product. It's well marketed. But after that, distribution. It was everywhere. It's hardly a place you could go where you couldn't get a Coke. The current rise of true crime favor can be traced to availability, right back to the nightly news barrage of urgent breaking stories, innocent victims, stranger danger, serial killers. And today, of course, media is digital and constant. Media is the distribution center, and media amplifies. I'm not saying there isn't a trend toward true crime podcasts and series, but media makes everything seem larger than it is. True crime. It's readily available. Next reason, even before, you know, availability, is our own fascination with death. Humans, largely regardless of spiritual beliefs, tend to agree that our time on this earth, in this vessel, is uh, temporary. They say our fascination and or fear of death is only human nature. For some of us, it's just minutes per week, others, hours per day, but we do think about it. True crime is another way to visit that darker side. Granted, not all crime stories are murders, but most of them are. Another reason could be pure adrenaline. It's the same reason many of us like horror movies or even riding some crazy impossible roller coaster. Adrenaline is a nice high. Physiologically, it makes us feel good. Unlike the roller coaster, or say, uh, you know, skydiving, there is no real physical dangers in watching true crime in the comfort of your own home. Except maybe for the faint of heart. So it's a safe shot of adrenaline. And once you get a shot or two, you want more. Another reason it's so popular, although I don't think this is a main one, 
is that ingesting true crime stories can be an outlet for our own dark thoughts. Now, I'm not saying that everyone wants to be a serial killer or is a potential criminal, but these kinds of stories and music and the arts et al. have always been ways for us to experience different emotions and thoughts without having to act upon them if we don't want to. It's not that you have empathy for a killer, although that has also happened, but more like you are living vicariously within this story that you wouldn't want to be living in in real life. Whose side you take in the story is up to you, I guess. Finally, the big reason that true crime is so popular, and it comes from this little bit of research data. The audience for true crime podcasts, series, and documentaries is almost 75% women. This, to me, is both complicated and obvious. Remember, the most highly successful true crime presentations are about murders. The killers, almost always men, and their victims, predominantly women. Not only are women the largest audience for true crime, but some of the most successful true crime stories, such as My Favorite Murder, are created and produced by women. As a matter of fact, the two women behind My Favorite Murder have a nickname for themselves, Murderinos. Psychologists and researchers mostly agree that women consume true crime partly as a way of research. It's an illusion of knowledge and control should they ever get into a similar situation. Remember that so many victims of violent crime are women. True crime, especially those stories that are somehow resolved, give women agency over their own situation, or at least the feeling of it. In general, 75% of any police force is male. Crimes and victims are seen through a male lens. Perhaps that male attitude is slowly becoming a bit more sensitive, but only a bit, and often the female perspective is absent. In true crime stories told by women, women hear their own voice and they see their own selves. A lot of these true crime series have also taken strides to refocus killer stories onto the victims, some barely mentioning or not even showing the killer. Also, the true crime story tends to be more fascinating when it is, shall I say, uh, about everyday people like you and me who somehow become part of a horrendous series of events. And after that first bit of research, female compulsion for the true crime story was thought to be odd. But here's the main difference. Male fascination with violence usually takes on a heroic form, scoring the big touchdown in that very physical football game, winning a war as a soldier, on and on. Females, on the other hand, because of decades of discrimination, look at violence from a potential victim point of view. It's really no surprise that they would want to arm themselves with as much information as possible. Males and females both have a fascination with violence, just takes on different forms. Look up online or, you know, just ask a woman the number of things a woman has to go through in a day that a man doesn't. Carrying your car keys in your hand when walking alone just in case you need a weapon. Oh, no headphones while jogging. How many guys call a friend when alone in a cab or Uber just to feel safer? or pretending to be on the phone at all to lessen uh, chances of harassment. Never leave a drink unattended. Well, the list just goes on and on. What women have to do that men don't. Women talking to women about crime committed on women by men not only means to them a more empathetic voice, it helps humanize victims. It is no coincidence, in my opinion, that the rise in popularity of true crime stories among women runs parallel to the rise of the Me Too movement. The other way that social interaction plays into this goes back to the town square, the church, and the crime pamphlets. It has been said that throughout history, in times of social upheaval, like today, society turns to true crime stories 
to help ourselves reinforce that there is a justice system and that it catches bad guys. And if it doesn't quite do that, we want more cops, more jails, the death penalty, and so on. And here is the politician that's going to get that done for us. True Crime Story presenters have also lately helped solve crimes. Most famously, Michelle McNamara, author of All Be Gone in the Dark, whose innovative methods and research helped nab the so-called Golden State Killer some 40 years after the fact. She also changed the way police now investigate some of the old and cold case murders. One of the main innovations was to use suspected killer's DNA, which would not otherwise be part of any criminal database. McNamara thought it would be possible to search voluntary DNA sites like Ancestry and others to find DNA with a familial similarity, then track the families down to a geographical location, and then look for any of those family members who might fit a profile involving time, place, opportunity, etc. It worked. Golden State Killer. Since, of course, debates have risen around issues of privacy, but the method is still being used. The other part of the story is that tragically, Michelle McNamara passed in her sleep before the book was uh, completed, so her husband, comedian, actor, Patton Oswalt, took on the task, finished her book with her co-researcher, and it has since become a bestseller and uh, made into an HBO docuseries. Other amateur sleuths and uh, true crime enthusiasts have opened up old murder cases all on their own. They pour over old records. They set up websites trying to get new information. Some are more successful than others. What it does is speak to more than just a fascination with listening and watching true crime, but in changing the narrative on violence against women. So let's recap. Why is true crime so popular? One, we all like playing detective. Two, it's human nature to be fascinated by death. Three, it's readily available content. Four, it's a good shot of adrenaline. Five, it's a possible cultural reaction to our times. Because, you know, in a way, true crime is like the opposite of fake news. And six, it's driven by women who see it as a means of research, control, and humanization. Or maybe it's just that one, you know, human nature, our fascination stemming from our own mortality, and everything else is just a byproduct of that. Either way, let me know if you have a fascination with true crime and what your favorite true crime series is. Also, let me know if you learned anything from this podcast. Always interested in your feedback. Here's my contact information. Later That Same Life is written, voiced, and produced by Larry Fedoric. LarryFedoric37 at gmail.com. Subscribe to Larry's podcast YouTube channel. Get automatic notifications with each new episode. 